art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Lord, open our hearts today. We are going to be reading from 1 Samuel. Uh, Samuel is our poster child today. Um, we are using him uh, not as the, you know, end all illustration of praying for our children, but I want you to understand from our children's perspective often what's going on. Uh, I want to say this, I want to paint a dark picture before we begin to put the color, the light colors on this presentation today. Um, I, I do believe that we are in a situation where the walls are down. Uh, societally, um, in a lot of churches, religiously, uh, the walls are down. Uh, the Word of God has been substituted with philosophy or um, what I call mercy talk. You know, just we make God unoffensive uh, with the idea of thinking we're bringing more people into the kingdom. And we're in a situation where the walls are down, and I'm talking about walls of protection. And in, from a biblical mindset, we don't think much about city walls here unless you live along the southern border. Um, and and it, it's, it's taken on a new reality there. But we don't think much about walls. But walls were the means of protection. And uh, walls were essential. And that's why as soon as Israel went back to Jerusalem, or Judah did, um, and they were to rebuild the city. The first thing they did was rebuild the temple because uh, you always put God first. But the second thing they did was to rebuild the walls because that was the protection that the city lacked. And um, the walls of protection are down in our nation and in a lot of nations. I think there's another wall down, uh, not the wall of protection, but the wall of separation. Um, the sacred has become profane, and the profane has become sacred. I was reading an article the other day, and, and someone said, we have to at all costs guard the sanctity of abortion. And I thought, um, of course, I'm, don't, I'm, I'm very definitely pro-life, but I thought, what mind would call the slaughter of the innocents a sanctity, but the Bible says that when a nation goes down the wrong path, good is called evil, evil is called good. So we've had that wall down as well. The, the sacred has become profane and the profane has become sacred. The third wall that's down isn't a big wall of preparation or, or uh, uh, protection, or it's not a big wall of separation. It's a little toddler gate. And what I mean by that is our children are in danger of captivity. I, I, don't, I don't mean we need to not let our kids play in the yard or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that because of our passivity, remember last week we talked about the dream of the serpents and the alligators. And I think because of passivity in so many circles in America, including the church, I think that we have adopted the mindset that that's what we pay taxes for. They are going to educate our children. They are going to take care of our children. And, and loved ones, what happens is we're, we're offering our children as, as uh, tasty mealtime snacks for serpents. And we, we need to understand, I'm very serious about this. You say, Pastor, I think you're over, uh, overstating this. I think you're overreacting. Well, all I can say is I don't. I don't think I'm overreacting. I think you're underreacting. And um, I think this is something we need to understand. The battle, uh, the most pitched battle that we face in our country right now, it, it's manifest in a lot of ways, but the target at the heart of it is our children. So that's why we're saying we want to get back to the place of, ano uh, of anointing so that we pray for our children. Let's read um, uh, Samuel's introduction to the world. 
And I think that'll help put it in perspective for us. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and men. And the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now, forgive me. I, I, I know that not all of you um, have been Christians long, and you might not know this story. Samuel was uh, the child of Hannah, who was barren, and she asked the Lord to give her a child, and she would give the child to the Lord for his service in the temple all the days of his life. And God did that. Uh, he was named Samuel, which means asked of God, and um, it's a very special name. And then the Lord blessed her because of her great sacrifice. He blessed her with other children too. So that's how uh, little Samuel ends up there at the, pre, uh, the temple. Well, the holy place. Um, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow dim that he could not see... And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the uh, ark of God was, temple had not been built yet. And while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. And he did, and he said, I did not call, lie down again. And he went and lay down. Um, then the Lord called yet again, Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered and said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now the spirit, I'm sorry, uh, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And what that means is um, uh, Samuel was so young that he did not have a matured relationship with the Lord. He knew he was serving the Lord, but he wasn't familiar with the Lord's ways. And um, he had never had any prophetic experience before. And verse 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And the, the story goes on. It's not part of our story, but God says that he's going to bring judgment on Eli and the house of Eli because Eli has not lived the life a priest ought to live. His sons have not lived the lives that priests ought to live. They were, they were having sexual relations with women who brought sacrifices, and they were dishonoring the Lord's offering by taking part that did not belong to them. And uh, God says, I'm going to judge them. And Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? And that, boy, you talk about a manipulative priest, you know, putting a little pressure on Samuel. Please do not hide it from me. God do to you and more also, if you hide anything from me, all the things that he said to you. But no pressure, you know. <laughs> then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Let's turn right to the book of Acts chapter 2 on the day of the church's birthday. But uh, Peter uh, is preaching because the Holy Spirit has fallen the great wind filled the uh, place where they were gathered. Um, tongues of fire settled upon them and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And 
the crowd said, what does this mean? You know, I mean, these men must be drunk. And uh, Peter said, no, that's, that's not what's going on. And he explains, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I want you to understand the landscape. I don't want to repeat what I preached last week, but Peter says to this group, on the day of Pentecost. He says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That's kind of a strange word. My daddy used to have a phrase. He said, quit your end warping around. And uh, I, of course I knew what he meant was hurry up. You know? And I remember one time asking him, what, what exactly is end warping? And he said, well, and he tried to explain it and was kind of distracted, didn't do a good job. But then later we came upon a dog that had rabies we found out. And the dog was, you know, all, he was just kind of walking like this, you know, and, and he'd just go one way and another and said, look at it, daddy said, look at his tail. That's in warping. He said, he, he's not going where he's trying to go. And he thinks he knows where he's going to go, but then he'll change. And even when he knows where he wants to go, he can't get there. He's going crazy. He's in warping. And uh, Peter in his preaching says, listen, straighten up and walk toward the goal. Quit your end warping. And when we talk about contending with our, for our children, not with our children, but for our children, the struggle, that means the struggle to surmount a difficulty or danger, just as there are things in life that get you distracted and off track. Uh, this generation that doesn't know Jesus, any generation that doesn't know Jesus, is said uh, to be a crooked generation or an untoward generation. And what that means is they're just, they, they think they know where they're going. They think they know what they want. But the scripture says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it always results in death. That's twice in the book of Proverbs. And so he says, come apart from this group that has an opinion about everything. I think if I remember correctly, yeah, yeah, it was Peter that on his Facebook account. He said, just look at what they post. He says, everybody has an opinion. They all know where they want to go, but they are in warping. They, they couldn't walk a straight line if they had to. Now, uh, <coughs> We talked about last, last week the dreams of the snakes and the gators and our children uh, facing difficulty. I won't repeat that, but you can go online and listen to it. And uh, we talk about um, the way that the enemy wants to distort and destroy children. Through our children, Messiah is coming, is what was presented in the book of Genesis. So the enemy always wants to, the enemy always wants to destroy life. That's why Pharaoh had the male babies after a point, uh, Jewish babies thrown into the river because he said, uh, we'll keep their women to serve us um, and to be our uh, domestics and to be, you know, our, our objects of sexual desire if we want. But don't let the men keep growing. Throw the babies into the river. And... Um, uh, the Bible says that the midwives of Egypt had compassion and they wouldn't throw the boys in the river. I mean, it, it had happened for a while, then it stopped happening and Pharaoh had to resort to other means. But when they were questioned about it, they said, well, the, you know how these Hebrew women are, they work so hard, we get word that they're in labor and they're already delivered and back in the field before we get there. And it was a lie. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, God bless the midwives because of their saving the babies. Now, most immature Christians really stop right there, and this is what they say. 
So, Pastor, what this teaches us is that it's okay to lie? And I said, no. You don't think they lied? I said, yeah, they lied like a rug, you know. <laughs> well, how could God bless them? I, I said, in my opinion, God didn't bless their lie. God blessed them for the value they put on life. Now, you know, I, I don't think we need to start lying to fight abortion, but I'm saying that we, we get, you know, we, we will, uh, you know, strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. We're trying to make a case for, is it okay to lie? I lost control of a small group one time using the story of, uh, about the, the babies and the Egyptian midwives. And I never could get the, the group back. I never could get it back. I was a young youth pastor and I thought, this is not going where I want it to go. The issue was not, did those ladies lie? <coughs> the issue was a much bigger one, and what did they think of the babies? That's why I, 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 I beg you, I beg you in the name of Jesus to don't buy into some shallow argument for abortion to say, well, it may be wrong, but, and if we don't abort, this could happen. You know, um, if abortion is wrong, no but matters. If abortion is murder, no but matters. And, and God said, the issue here is, are these babies going to live? Are these babies going to die? It's always been the plan of the enemy to destroy them. And even when Israel... Um, kept wanting to go into the wilderness and Moses kept saying, let my people go. You know, Mo, uh, Pharaoh would say, okay, go, but do this, go do that. You know, he said, go, but don't go far. And he said, I don't know where the Lord's going to lead us, Moses said. So I can't tell you that we won't go far. He, he said, go, but leave your riches behind. No, we've got to go. That's part of worship is everything we are, everything we have is presented to the Lord. And then he came upon this nefarious idea. He said, okay, you can go, take your stuff, go wherever you want to go, but leave your children behind. And I think that a lot of people would have seen that as Wait, wait a minute, you're talking about free babysitting? You're talking about you'll take care of our kids and we may be gone for a while? Moses says, no, you don't understand. Our children are our greatest treasure and there's nothing we're going to pursue that we won't pursue with our children. If it's worth pursuing, it's worth pursuing with our children. See, so, and the enemy always has a, well, if you're going to serve God, it's okay, but just give the kids a break. Give them a break. And that's why we put so much time and money and interest into children, because we, 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 we could have, we could draw a bigger crowd in here if we wanted to put some money into something. And, and I got my hair braided and wore bowling shoes. We could, <laughs> we could draw a bigger crowd. <laughs> but we're not going to do anything where we leave our children behind, where we stick them in a room, you know, and say, well, we'll y'all take care of the babies while we have church. I, I, would, I would rather have our babies all in here than treated that way. And Moses says, no, we're not going to, to leave our children behind. And so it evolved from... Satan trying to dismantle and disrupt the family to uh, trying to eliminate half the children to offering all, well, it wasn't all of the children, but a great number of the children to the God um, Moloch uh, as a burnt sacrifice. Lovins, you got to understand, Israel, when their babies were sacrificed, God considered that murder. <laughs> and that's also the straw that broke the camel's back. That's when God said, now it's time for judgment and it's sure. And I don't think, I really don't think, and I know we're in a tough time. And I, I, I want you to understand that there is legislation in place or being put in place. When for us to have a service like this and for me or Pastor Corey to say something like this, it becomes a criminal offense. And we need to realize that unless God helps us, we don't know what the next few years are going to look like. <coughs> Excuse me. We just don't know what it's going to look like. 
But when Israel began to sacrifice their children, God said this. Um, a couple of times the, the inference was, okay, th this is too far. But another place it says clearly, I am sending you away from the land because it is this sin that you're doing that made me drive out the nations before you. He drove out the other nations because of child sacrifice and their other sin. And he said, you think I'm going to let you stay in the land when you are committing the same sin that the ones who before you committed? No, the enemy has always worked against children. You say, well, but Messiah's already come. He can't stop Messiah from coming. I know that. But I want to tell you the nature of the enemy. He comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. John 10. That's what he does. That's his thing. Kill, steal, destroy. And the enemy still wants to destroy our children because he hates life. He wants to spread rebellion against God. He wants to take us out of our children's lives. Um, um, oh, there's so many things I'd like to say. I just, I don't have time. You need to be on guard against people that would disrupt your home. You need to be on guard against people that would disrupt your home. And it's getting worse every month. Okay. Um, we need to understand that uh, we are in the middle of a spiritual conflict and it's leading to more and more persecution. And one of the, the sharpest weapons of the enemy is to separate the children from the parents. That's why when Malachi the prophet spoke, he said, you want to know what happens when Messiah comes? And he says, this is what's got to happen. This has to happen. He said, when Messiah comes, he's going to begin to turn the hearts of the children back to their parents. And he's going to begin to turn the hearts of the parents back to their children. You know, we get so upset about some sexual sins and we say, well, you know, the Bible says in the last days there are going to be people with unnatural affection. That may be what it's talking about when it says unnatural affection. That's another sermon for another time. But I want to tell you what else is unnatural affection. Uh, the way we treat our children. I say we, I'm talking about society. Um, I read that a man wanted his girlfriend to get an abortion and she didn't want an abortion. So when he had the baby, he said, all right, if you won't handle this, I will. So he said, let me take the breast milk to your mama's house. And taking the breast milk to his mama's house, he, he injected antifreeze into the baby's uh, breast milk uh, in an attempt to kill the child. And I, I think the child survived, but was in the hospital for a long time. And uh, you say, oh my God, well, that's, that's normal in, in this society. Not normal, but it's, it's frequent. Yeah. It's frequent. There is amazing cruelty, unspeakable cruelty. And the reason I'm calling it an unnatural affection is number one, people shouldn't want to treat anybody that way. I mean, I, I have people that I don't think like me, but I don't, I don't want that to happen to anybody. You know, I don't want anybody to go to hell. I'd like them to maybe just get shaken over it, you know, <laughs> just, I, I don't, just, just for a second, you know, but that's, that's pure carnality talking. I mean, God's, you know, he's not going to do that, but we, we are in a society where our children are slaughtered by neglect and by abortion, and it's in the name of it's inconvenient for me. And that's why I tell people all the time that ad adopted children, foster children, need to understand they are the most blessed and fortunate people in all the world. And um, they should never, we should never imply that they are a burden. And loved ones, I want to tell you this. I, I know that... Um, you know, a lot of times you can hear things and they get exaggerated, but I've been a pastor a long time and I've, I think I've have a pretty good feel for how to interpret and what's legitimate and what's not. We're in a situation right now where there just seems to be an attack on our homes, uh, not coming from our parents, or, but it just seems to be that children are terrified. We, and I know kids go through times when they are afraid. I, I know all of that. <clears throat> 
And um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about normal childhood fears. But there has been such an increase in the past few months in children being terrified to go to bed, to go to, uh, to, go to sleep. And uh, again, you're always going to have that in some children. That's part of life. But not all of this is normal. And not all of this is natural. And I, I think we need a move of God to break this off of our families and off of our children. Now, we, we're, we're not going to be free from challenges. And, you know, a kid watches a, you know, Wooly Booger movie, he's probably going to have a bad dream. Or, but but I'm, I'm talking about we need discernment to understand what's of the Lord and what's not. And don't make the kid the villain in this. Don't get exasperated with them. Um, oh, I'll save it. Okay, um, let's, now, now that's kind of the, the landscape we're dealing with. Um, I, you have, number two in your outline are eight ways to begin praying for our children. And I was going to just read this, but I won't even do that. The card is self-explanatory. I've given you this before. These are eight things. You say, well, I love my children and I want to pray for them. I just don't know how to, you can only say, help Johnny be a good boy so many times. Well, this is, this is a good starter list. And you can make a page for each one in your bulletin or, or your prayer journal. That's a place to start. Eight ways to begin praying for our children. And with that in mind, I want to move right to the Christian life lessons because we're good. I know we, we're a half hour late starting, um, and that was Justin's fault. Uh, <laughs> never mind. Um, no, we just, we just had to, to deal with some things. And, uh, or, I mean, in the Word, to deal with things. Um, but I, but I want to go right to the Christian life lessons, and we want to end with a prayer. We want to end praying for our children, because I ask you to write down two or three things for your children, and I hope you did, and can transfer it to the notebook here. Let, let's go to Christian life lessons. There are seven, and I'll do them as quickly as I can before we pray. Number one, never underestimate the value of spirit-led parenting. Never underestimate the value of spirit-led parenting. Every parent that I know probably has just in exasperation says, my children don't listen to me. I can tell them, you can give them advice that is gold and silver wisdom. And a lot of times they won't listen. And you say, well, yeah, they, yeah, they just won't listen. They're in rebellion. No, nah, they're kids. And I tell you what happens, you give them this great advice and they won't listen. And then their neighbor's kids, Uncle Dickie shows up and says the same thing. And your child says, yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. When early when I was a pastor, you know, I would try to drill. I mean, I, I, I had so many insecurities, but I'd try to drill stuff. I didn't think people were listening. And I, I will never forget one of my deacons stood up one night and said, you know, I've been struggling with something for years. And he said, I even talked to pastor about it, but he didn't help. And I thought that's, that's what a first time pastor needs to hear. I talked to pastor, but he didn't help. And he said, I just want to tell you, I was watching Jimmy Swaggart. And he, he said this, 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 and this, four things. And, and I said to myself, that's exactly what I told him. That's exactly what I told him. And old Jimbo gets all the credit, you know. <laughs> Parents, I want to tell you, that happens so often. They can hear something from a friend's parent that is pure gold, and it's almost word for word what you said. Uh, it's not that your kids don't love you. It's just, you know, even Jesus, his own brothers and sisters didn't believe in him. And, and uh, he, he, he said, it, there's an old saying that says, no prophet is without honor unless it's in his own town or in his own country. There's something about it. The closer you are to somebody, sometimes it's, the cl it's just harder for them to accept it from you. You say, well, it's because we're not consistent or they see we're not living it. I don't know. You can't, you can't say that about Jesus. 
I mean, and they had, Jesus had the same problem. So it's not necessarily your fault, but I want you to know, don't give, your, don't give up on your children. There are things you can say that will, that will destroy your child's self-esteem and will seriously hinder, if not destroy, your relationship with your children. Um, and and, and you, you, you need to be sure before you say things like, you're just stupid. You, you know, your, your sister gets this, your brother gets this, you're just stupid. I want to tell you, that will cut a scar that will probably never go away. Uh, telling the child, you don't want them. You know, I don't, I don't want you in the home anymore. You're going to have to leave. Loved ones, it's got to be something. I can't fathom anything that our children should do that should make us stop loving them. And, and I, think it's, I think it is not good. I think it is not good for us to say, you know, if you're going to smoke, you got to leave home. If you're going to drink, you got to leave home. Um, number one, I want them to have a safe place to come back to. But you say, well, but I, I don't want to argue with you about it. But I, I want you to understand this. When, when, now, I, I do realize that there could be a time that they're putting other children at danger. And, and, and that would be the exception. That would be the exception. But even then, I would help them find a place that they would go. But loved ones, we are letting our childishness a lot of times exceed the childishness of our child. We're letting our own hurts, our own insecurities, our own flaws. We're trying to live our life through them. And we're trying to redeem our mistakes by not letting them make mistakes. And guys, I want to, I, I just, I, I want to tell you, never doubt or underestimate the value of spirit-led parenting, but never underestimate the power of bad parenting either. So we need to be led by the Holy Spirit and we need to plant those seeds. Here's number two, bless your children. And this is on, uh, no, it isn't, it's not on the card, but it's, it's in the outline. Um, of course it is, that's what we're looking at. But I was thinking of um, the outline I gave you last week. When we say bless your children, there, there's an easy way to pray a covering over your children by remembering B is bodies, L is bless their learning, or if they're grown, bless their labor, bless their emotional life, bless their social life, that is their relationships, bless their spiritual life. And I, I have started something years ago. Um, I, I have alarms set on my phone or my watch and um, if, if, it, if I'm in a meeting or something and I can't do it, I'll, I'll, I'll hit snooze and it defaults to another time. But every day at 8 a.m., my clock goes off to remind me to pray for the favor and the provision of the Lord over my children, my grandchildren, every day at 10 o'clock except on Sunday because we're at in service, and I have it said another time on Sunday, I pray for the covering of the blood of Jesus every day. My children, my grandchildren are prayed for, you know, my wife, uh, that they will live, we will all live under the favor of the Lord and that God will give us provision because sometimes the favor of the Lord is a negative thing. What I mean is he doesn't allow something to happen. But sometimes the, the favor of the Lord is a positive thing, but you need to have resources to take advantage of it. So we pray for the favor and the provision of the Lord. At 10 o'clock every day, the alarm goes off and I plead the blood of Jesus over all my children and my grandchildren, my wife, my family. And, um, and I've got an alarm set for praying for the church. Uh, and I pray these things over you. Um, at 2 p.m., uh, my alarm goes off and I pray for a life of fullness. I want them to be full of the Spirit. I want them to be uh, full of faith. I want them to be full of the Scriptures. I want them to be full of good works. And uh, these are just ways that you can pray for your children. At 4 p.m., uh, angelic intervention and protection is what I pray for. And then at 6, I pray for the peace and the presence of God to attend us through the night. And, um, and I also pray for God to manifest his power. But that comes in the, in the idea of fullness. Now, number three, ask God to protect your children as they grow up in the presence of the Lord. I just want to say this quickly. Now, don't underestimate your value as a parent. Bless your children. Number three, 
Be sure that your children are able to grow up in the presence of the Lord. Uh, loved ones, there are so many things that will seem like an opportunity that pulls you out of church, pulls your children out of church. I have seen, I have seen parents, and again, I'm not talking about anybody here. I've seen it enough. I don't have to refer to anybody here. But I've seen parents because they think a child can make it on Broadway pull their kids out of everything at church and put them in the devil's playpen and try to, try to make them a spiritual, uh, I mean, a, a, a financial success in the eyes of the world while pulling them out of church. I, I've seen guys that think their child is the next Michael Jordan or the next um, Wayne Gretzky or something, and they'll get in all of these leagues that cause their kids to miss church. And guys, I'm not saying anybody's going to hell over that. I'm just saying, is that really where you want to invest your time in your children? Is that really going to yield? You know, it, it's it, 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 good things need to be compared. Like Paul said, bodily exercise profits a little but spiritual exercise profits a lot. He wasn't saying we shouldn't do exercise. Probably most of us need more exercise. He wasn't saying bodily exercise is evil, spiritual exercise is good. No, in fact, he said they're both good. They're both good. But when you compare the good of this with the good of this, there's no comparison. And that's the toughest thing for parents because it's not hard to decide between good and bad. Well, let's see. You can go to church camp this week, or you can go to a how to make methamphetamine camp. You know, no, we don't have trouble with good and bad, but we need to understand that our children and children have no, they have no concept, especially when they're young, like we think they do. You offer a child a check for $5 million, I mean a legitimate check for $5 million, or a Spider-Man toy, that three or four year old looks at that paper, he'll take the, he'll take the $10 Spider-Man. And, and that's why it's our job to make those hard decisions. We, ha we have to make hard decisions and explain so that they can make hard decisions later and, and, and make, make good ones. I want my children to grow up in the presence of the Lord. I, I want to encourage you, loved ones, watch what's in your house. Watch what you let in your house. And um, I don't want to go back to a clothesline preaching mentality. I don't want to do any of that. But I want you to know that we don't want the door open in any way for our enemy. Now, you say, oh, pastor, I've always believed that. Uh, yeah, let me tell you, I, the, you also know that there's always going to be a half dozen people around you that say, do you know that towel that's hanging on your rack is the color of Gryffindor from Harry Potter? <laughs> and you need to get rid of that towel because it teaches witchcraft and to you, you're just saying, oh, this is just pretty color. I just, you know, I just like the color. There's nothing on it. You are always going to have people that try to tend to your business and try to attend to your standard of righteousness. And I don't mean to be offensive. I think most of those people are well-meaning, but they're terribly frustrating. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I, journaling, I'll tell you this because this person's not in this church anymore. He's not even alive anymore, but, but, uh, when I was teaching SESL about journaling, I said, the reason journaling is so important to me and I've journaled all my life, I said, is because when I was in the ninth or 10th grade, I read Dracula, the novel. And I said, from beginning to end, Dracula is nothing but journal entries. That's all it is. And I had this fascinating story. And by the way, Dracula of Hollywood is different than the Dracula story in the book. Dracula book was a, was a story about good versus evil and righteousness versus evil. Uh, movies have made it about everything else, um, from vampire sex to whatever. But anyway, I said, that's where I fell in love with the idea of journaling, was, was reading uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And a person came to me and said, you need to take all of your journals and burn them because they were born in the heart of Satan. And it went on and on and on. And 
you know, I, I finally realized I couldn't reason or even talk to this person. So I just said, you know, I'll ask the Lord about it. And uh, that, I think that was the last conversation we ever had. There's going to be people like that. And you say, Pastor, you, I feel like you're talking about me. Well, if I am, then learn from what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> it's, it's not my neighbor's responsibility to come over and say, listen, I think you ought to paint your house a different color. Um, or you invite your neighbor to dinner and you say, uh, uh, you know, the lady says, I, this, this is good lasagna, but, you know, it'd be a lot better if you'd cook it this way. N no, you say thank you for the lasagna. You, you say thank you for at least painting your house, even if it's not the color I would want, you know. No, you don't do that. It's inappropriate. And that's why it's so hard to really live holiness because you've got to live by your own convictions, but others will be glad to impose their convictions on you. That was not in my notes. I'm sorry. Let's, uh, <laughs> we want them to grow up in the presence of the Lord. Number four, ask God to give your children Samuel encounters. Yes. Ask God to come to your children I'm so proud of, um, of our youth and children's programs because they are drawing our kids to encounter the Holy Spirit, to encounter the power of God. Um, we, we, our children, our goal is for this next generation to be far more comfortable with the presence and manifest presence of God than we are. We, we want them to be just wide open, balanced, but wide open. And um, I, I also want to just give you one more thing that's not in my notes, okay? Uh, but I can tell Justin really wants me to say it. <laughs> and, and Corey's nodding his head too. Um, a lot of times, I, I know it's normal for kids to, uh, you know, get scared or especially if they watch something they shouldn't watch or whatever. I know that. I understand that. But um, um, sometimes we need discernment because our kids might be open to, to the spirit. And a lot of times when you're open to the Holy spirit, the enemy tries to block that as well. And you need discernment to just don't, you know, if the kid says there's, there's a monster in my closet, it, it don't say, Oh, there's no monster in your closet that you're lying. Go to sleep, get up and look in the closet and, and tell your kid, you know, it, it depends on the kid. It depends on the kid, but you might say, well, you know, even if you did see something, it's not there now and God can take care of you. Let me tell you what to do if you see something like that again. You, that's why the Bible says you've got to train up a child in the way he should go so that when he's old, he won't depart from it. Okay, so what we do is um, we, we ask God to give our children Samuel encounters. And here's number five, ask God to give you the presence of mind to recognize those sacred moments and help your children navigate them. Um, Eli was probably a good man, but he had some issues in his life that made him kind of dull and um, in, in his senses. And it took him three times to realize what was going on. I'm not, I'm not fussing him cause, at him because we don't always know what's going on in the lives of our children. But we need to pray and get clarity from the Lord so that we can understand what's taking place. Ask God to give your children Samuel encounters and then ask God to give you the presence of mind to recognize those sacred moments. Help your children navigate them and then just contend for your children. Th this is not going to be easy. Wars are not won with one battle. And we want to contend with our children, and that means we're willing to pay the price for our children in prayer and in sacrifice. And the thing that is last is you want to welcome the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That means give, uh, give the Holy Spirit access to work in your life and to work in the life of your children. And it may mean we welcome, you know, you, you may need to develop a, you know, a family altar. And family altars don't need to be another church service, you know. But, but we, we made up our minds, Ramona and I did, that we were going to pray with our children every morning before they left. 
and um, we're going to give them a verse every day. That prayer may only be 60 seconds, depending, especially as they get older, they're running late for work and whatever. Um, it, it may only be 60 seconds, but every day they're going to know they're prayed for, and every day they're going to get a verse, and every night uh, we're going to have a little bit longer, and maybe our nighttime prayers when the kids were little would go maybe five or six minutes. We, we weren't trying to have another church, but we wanted them to grow in the presence of the Lord. We wanted the Holy Spirit to be welcome, to move in our midst. Um, and we need to be sensitive to both the good and the bad move of the Spirit. I'm going to ask Anna to come, and, and, and sweetie, you're going to have to be very brief because somebody's taking all our time here. Uh, is, is, is she still in here? Oh, oh, oh. I want her to give a testimony just for, just for a minute or so. And, um, but this is an example of what we're talking about. And um, I felt like when we were praying during first service, the Lord reminded me of something that um, one, of our, one of my siblings told us that the Lord showed them. And it was a dream that they had one night. And they were playing a, a video game on the, on the, in the dream, he would, um, they were playing a video game. And all of a sudden, this evil spirit started coming out of the TV and started to like manifest. And uh, what they did is that they say, get away from me, you know, in the name of Jesus. And the spirit left the room. But then the spirit did not leave the house. The spirit moved to the next room to our youngest sibling. And, um, or one of them. And so instead of, and then the spirit started to torment the um, youngest sibling. And so, you know, they didn't know how to fight. They said Jesus, but they didn't know how to fight. And so um, the spirit in started tormenting them. And then my, the sibling who was having the dream woke up. And uh, the Lord said, get rid of the video game. And they did. Um, I couldn't discern what the Holy Spirit wanted me to say, but I realized what the Holy Spirit said, what he's not saying. The Holy Spirit is not saying video games are bad. The Holy Spirit is not saying television is bad. What I felt like he was saying was, what is more important to us, our entertainment or our children? We need to prioritize our children over our entertainment. Convictions for each person are different. We all have different convictions. Some of us are uncomfortable with this game or this television show for different reasons. So we need to be aware of what affects our children personally and what affects our children spiritually and then be willing to lay that down for their sake. Amen. Good, good, good job. Thank you. Now, I want to talk about this kind of thing and then we'll pray. Um, when we're talking about welcoming the fullness of the Holy Spirit, um, I, I, think, I think my parents were the greatest parents on planet Earth. I, I really do. Um, but my family was um, like a lot of West Florida Southern families, um, especially along the coast, you know, whether it's uh, Charleston or Savannah or Pensacola or uh, New Orleans. Uh, cities on the coast had a lot of influx from other religions. And um, what the best way I know how to describe my house, they, they, they love Jesus. My mom and dad love Jesus with all their heart. But that part of the country, there's a lot of folks that may be tongue talking Pentecostal Christians, and 90% or 95% of what they involve themselves in is biblical and of the Lord. But they, there's a five, six percent that they hold to that's just pure superstition. You know, my, my daddy told me, now if you dig a hole, if you use post hole diggers, don't dig it on a full moon or you won't have enough dirt to go back in the hole, you know. And, and some of it was just funny stuff like that, you know. Uh, just these superstitions. 
But uh, I want to tell you, the, the 5% that they didn't know how to deal with, they reverted to the old mountain stuff. I mean, I call it mountain. To us, we think of mountain stuff. Um, my, my brother, that, my middle brother that uh, died not too long ago, uh, the day he died, he told me about this. He says, there was a man that used to walk through the house and, and he said, I just, I was terrified. Uh, he'd stop and look in at me and I went and told daddy that somebody was in the house and, and daddy said, there's nobody in the house. And, you know, and then later, uh, I think my dad had seen the man and my brother said, daddy, that man's back. And daddy said, well, son, uh, what you do when a dead person comes through, you always stop and ask them what they want because they want something. And that was the tradition. That was the, if, if, a, if a dead person comes, ask them what they want. Now we say that silly, but that was that mix with, with Bible truth that my family had been brought up with. And my brother, uh, he wouldn't tell me about it because he knew it would scare me to death. Um, then he started seeing, you know, ladies come through the house uh, that were what he called evil nuns. I mean, we don't think nuns are evil, but these were. These nuns were evil. And he said, I'd wake up, they'd just be looking at me. And um, uh, so, he, he said, I was afraid to ask, what do you want? Because I thought they'd say you, you know. <laughs> and he lived his teen years in absolute terror of that house and, and never, never told me about it till, till you know, we were both old men. But uh, I went through a similar experience of, of uh, absolute torment. And um, it, was, it was, I think, because we opened the door. That theology of our house allowed for a, a, a realm you can't understand. And uh, I was a, a fan, a collector of famous monsters of Filmland magazine. And I had the... the the models, we put together models in those days. You didn't buy action figures. You put the, the model together. And uh, we, di we did that, and then you painted it. We did that until the hippies started sniffing glue, and then they... <laughs> but I, I had, I had uh, Frankenstein, Dracula, the mummy, the invisible man. He was an easy one to put together. Um, <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I don't know, all these things, and I loved it. I had the, the monster, famous Monsters of Filmland magazines on top of my bed, you know, the bookcase of my bed, and I, and I just loved it. I'd come home from school and watch Dark Shadows, uh, which was, I think, you know, you may look at it now and say it's tame, but I want to tell you, it was a channel for some pretty raunchy things in the spirit. And uh, I, I got to the point where I was afraid to go to my room by myself. Then I got to the point where I couldn't sleep unless the light was on. And my grandmother lived with us. And she tried to, you know, pray with me. And I was okay if my grandmother was in there. I was terrified, but as long as she was in there, we got to the point where I, I, I couldn't get to sleep unless I could reach over to the other bed, had twin beds, and hold my grandmother's hand. And for months, I went to sleep holding my grandmother's hand. Then I couldn't do that anymore because I realized that a vampire could bite me if I got out from under the cover. I want to tell you, I was, I was uh, 50 years old before I'd ever sleep with my feet out from under the cover. Because, um, but let me, let me tell you, it got worse and worse. It got to the point where just sitting in the room, I, 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 could, not, I could not function um, I, I ended up sleeping in my parents' bed for, I mean, and I'm, I'm not a little guy. I'm, I'm like junior high age uh, and, and, and elementary school, late elementary school age. And this is, just, this is just eating me alive. Mother is coming in. She's praying. And I could tell that she was getting a little exasperated, you know, having to pray every night. But I was just absolutely terrified. And um, it, got, it got so bad that when I would watch a TV show and somebody had blood on them, that I would just start trembling and thinking vampires coming to our house. And you say, well, you, you just sound like you were an immature kid. No, I was a kid that had a real sensitivity to spiritual things. I mean, my older brother, none of that seemed to bother him. 
Um, and then after he, you know, we talked about it, we realized you, you never lived in that house. You know, you, we had the haunted house. And um, he had gone off to the Marine Corps, but me and my other brother were just, were, were traumatized. And by now my brother's gone off to college. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I realize I am, I am broken. I can't sleep. I, I love Jesus. I, 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 I love Jesus with all my heart. I'd been baptized in the Spirit, but I didn't understand what was going on. And finally, uh, the, the pastor came, talked to me. He prayed, and um, he said, Sister Chitty, is there anything that just might give an open door to the devil? And, um, you know, he's, he's asking that after being in my room and looking at all these models and things. And I had a really bad night, and I told my mother, I said, Tell Brother Stevenson, I'm going to tear up all of these models. I'm going to throw these magazines. And I did it in tears. I had a great collection. Uh, I could probably retire today if I had all of that stuff, you know, in this original, you know, well, I wouldn't do that, passing demons off to somebody else. But <laughs> as I got rid of it, I cried. I, I, I cried. That's what kind of a grip it had on me. And I love the Lord. And the pastor prayed, and then he kept praying. He never came back again. But one night, it, it, it wasn't long after getting rid of that stuff. My, my mom uh, got rid of some stuff. And um, it wasn't long after that, while my mom was praying, it just lifted. It wasn't anything tremendous or dramatic. It just lived. I felt it lift. I felt something leave the house, and it never bothered me again. Now, if you're having trouble with your kids like this, I'm not saying you've got something in your house or that you live in a haunted house, but I'm telling you, you're going to have to do what my mom did. You're going to have to figure out what's going on and let God give you wisdom to know how to handle it. And um, looking back, I think there were things in our house that came from that old heritage that, that should never have been there. And I've, I felt this so strongly first service, and I'm, I'm gonna say it now, it may, I don't know if it applies to anybody or not, but some of you have artifacts in your home, love letters from somebody other than your spouse, special gifts that they gave you, you know, or, or you might have pornography, and I mean, the, the list could go on and on. Um, but I, I, and I know that I have a sensitivity to spiritual things, but I can't stay in a house with that kind of stuff in it. I know what it did to me as a child. And I'm telling you, you might want to just say, if there's something going on, you might want to say, Lord, what, what have I got? Do I have, you know, do I have a, you know, a fertility stick? Do I have, um, do I have crystals that are supposed to alter moods? Do I have, you know, a voodoo doll? What, what, what might be in my home? And you say, Pastor, that's just, that's just legalism. No, even in the book of Acts, they burned things associated with dark arts. They burned things associated with dark arts. And I, I want to, lest you're not convinced, let me give you one more story. Um, and, and I know we're over, but I'm past the guilt. Um, <laughs> Um, my mom, I said, they grew up in that culture. Um, when, I, when I was growing up, I loved it to go sit with my dad and the old timers and just tell about the stories, you know, the ghost stories. And, oh, and um, there was a house that my a family member owned and my mom and her siblings lived in that house with their mother, of course. My grandfather had run off and left them. I, I never saw a grandfather until I was 12 years old. And um, they lived in this house. A person had been murdered there. Um, a, a child had been murdered there. And um, they could walk to and from church, going to an Assembly of God church. And after my mom started, she was the oldest, after she started uh, dedicating her life to the Lord, a curious thing started happening. She, uh, she said that as soon as the house came into view, 
She said there was like a, a, a ball of fire. He, she said sometimes it looked like a lantern and we thought somebody was walking around the house. But usually it was just a ball of fire that would just go around the house and circle the house. And um, there's more to it, but it would just scare you. And I don't want to, I'm not, the purpose of this is not to promote fear. You say, it wouldn't scare me. Yeah, it would. Oh, yeah, it would. <laughs> I know things. And uh, the strange thing is that it would just circle the house until they walked up to just a few feet from the gate. Then the, the fire would go into the house, into the room. It was only a two-bedroom house, so um, it was the room where all the kids slept, and it would go to my mother's bed, and it was in my mother's bed, and it would be like someone with chains jumping up and down, jumping up and down, and it would not stop until my mother laid in the bed, and um, everybody knew about it. And there was a revival going on at church, and the, the evangelist asked my grandmother, she, he said, Sister Weeks, could I, could I go to your house? I've heard about this. Could I go after church tonight, me and the pastor, my wife, and just, just go and see what's going on? Maybe we could help. And she said, sure. He said, does it ever hurt her? She said, no, but it's just like it's demanding her attention, just demanding her attention, and it will not stop until she lays down. It, nobody else can lay down and it stop. It just keeps going or gets louder. It has to be Eunice, that's my mother, to lay down on it. And uh, he went in, he saw, or as he approached the house, he saw the light, everything was just as they said. He walked in and went into that room and, and the man said it was like a full grown person just jumping up and down with chains and you could hear the springs, you know, whatever creek, I guess. And, and he, he said it was just an incredibly evil presence. And she, he said, she lays on the bed and then all this stops. And my grandmother said, well, sometimes the feeling doesn't stop, the, 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 the scaredness. But he said, she goes to sleep, you know, terrified. And now she's gotten to the point where it doesn't bother her anymore. She just lays there and goes to sleep. And he kind of prayed silently for a moment. And my mom said, I'll show you. My mom was about 14. And uh, she was 13 or 14. She was walking to the bed and he grabbed her arm and says, don't, don't, go in, don't get in the bed. Don't get in the bed. And she said, it won't stop until I get in the bed. And grandmother, she's, she's right, preacher. It won't stop until she gets in the bed. And he said, let me do something first. And he stood at the foot of the bed and, you could, and they said you could see him praying and trying to hear the Lord. And he then looked at the bed and said, you foul, damnable spirit from hell. You that have come to destroy and molest and to ruin this girl's life. I bind you in the name of Jesus I plead the blood of Jesus over this home and this bed. I command you to go back to hell or wherever it is you came from and never touch this family again. You say, okay, I'll, I'll write that down. I'll remember that. Well, let me tell you the rest of it. When he said that, it, it in Jesus' name, and when he said that, it said that the covers kind of fluffed a little bit. And over the bed, he said, light came together, formed like that ball of fire that was going around. And he said it shot out the window. And as it went out the window, uh, my mother said it was an ear piercing scream of terror. She said, I, I asked my grandmother about it later. She said, it sounded like somebody going to hell. It left and they said it lifted the oppression. It never came back, never bothered them again. And what the family learned is that you don't put up with this kind of stuff. You don't, you are not a slave. You are not a slave to these things. And we can take authority. 
You say, well, I just, I just want, I just, I've done it over and over again and I prayed. I want whatever it is in my house to leave. Loved ones, that's our problem. We just want the problem fixed. We, we, my grandmother would have told you that the Lord took them through some heavy discipleship and that's where they began to break off of that stuff. And loved ones, I want to tell you, your children are worth the fight and you're tired and you're saying things that are stupid. You're making decisions that are not right. You're being called to unconditional love and you love your child, but you are worn out. <coughs> That's why we want to pray today. Everything Satan does has as at least a secondary goal to wear out the people of God. And I, I want to tell you, you, you don't want your child to feel that they're not wanted. You don't want your child to feel that they are a hopeless case. And the, I'm telling you, what I'm feeling in the spirit is, <coughs> excuse me, the enemy is trying this new tactic because what's going on in the world is just sucking the energy out of us. It's sucking the life out of us. And when we get distracted, that's when snakes arrive and that's when alligators arrive per the dream and start gobbling and devouring things that are precious to us. No, I can't live that way anymore. I won't live that way anymore. I will not let my child be molested without fighting. I will not let my home be infiltrated without resistance. I, I will not do it. I was in Israel one time at a place that was a site for, uh, um, in the Bible account of, of a lot of tremendous demonic activity. It was less than two miles from the place where the demoniac and the guard, the two men that were chained and demon possessed. It was that area and where the demons were, ran down a hill into the sea. And um, it, it was less than two miles from there. And some of you were on, on that trip too, uh, there at Tiberias. And um, this has only happened like four times in my life. But I went to sleep and had, there's some, I've had the, these dreams like four times. Uh, and, and it's, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but it's not just a dream dream. It's like I'm entering another dimension. And, and I'm, I'm fighting this, and I saw attacks on the staff. I saw attacks on the church. And I saw how nefarious and evil it was. And I woke up saying, oh, Jesus. And there were four. It, it's only the second or third time that I think I've actually seen demonic spirits. And there were four in that room. And I'm, I'm on a trip to the Holy Land. And I rebuked them. I said, you go in the name of Jesus. And they immediately left. But I've often wondered. You say, well, you just had it in your mind. That was a demon-possessed area. But I wonder if there aren't things that attach themselves to things. And it may be land. It may be possessions. But I knew that I was in a place that had some defilement. Don't let your home be a place of defilement. Oh boy, I'm going to pray. If you have to go, when I close my eyes, you can leave because I, please don't do it till I close my eyes so I won't, so I won't be devastated. You have this prayer and it, it'll take us about five to seven minutes. We want to pray it. It's a prayer of contending for our children. This is what I want to do. You can pray it with me, you know, read along. Or you can listen because I'm praying it over all of us. But take the prayer home. And this is one of the prayers I would advise you to pray for your children. Now this is what we want to do. Justin, would you mind joining me up here? Just so, so there's two of us up here. Um, this is what I want you to do. Um, begin to pray systematically over your children. Guys, you say, Pastor, why are you talking so long about this? How, so, three Sundays. Loved ones, I, I want to tell you, this is a pivotal point in our church's growth. Messiah, according to Malachi, his coming is so important because he's going to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers back to the children. There is something more powerful than you and I know 
about the, uh, when a family is united in harmony. Paul, uh, Peter said, he said, pray with your wives according to knowledge or dwell with your wives according to knowledge and pray so that uh, together so that your prayers not be hindered. Man, you, you, talk, you want to talk about going to revival or spiritual powerhouse. Just turn your house into a house of united prayer and evict everything that belongs to the enemy. <laughs>